Sometimes the most innocuous looking things are dangerous. We can apply this to a lot of items that we see on our daily routine, which if used incorrectly can become dangerous. Many accidents occur from people not understanding the risks of the activity that they are doing. And work sites are no different, be it accidental falls, being hit by debris or incorrectly using tools. Today's subject is about how one silly mistake led to someone losing their leg. And it's not how you might think, as the cause of the amputation would also result in others feeling ill. The item in question that looked so innocent turned out to be a powerful radiation emitting source. Today we are looking at the Yanango radiological accident. My name is John and welcome to Plainly Difficult. This video wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for my Patreon, YouTube and Ko-fi members. If you want to early access to the channel's videos, then you can from just £1 per month. As always, the links will be in the pinned comment below. So before we begin this video, I have based this very heavily off the IAEA investigation into the incident. To read more information about it, please check out the link under the sources section in the pinned comment. Background. So before we get into some radiation based nightmares, we need to talk about the country in which the radiological accident happened. This for today is Peru. And like almost any country in the world, it has a regulatory framework for the use of many different dangerous materials. And for radioactive materials, this is no different. In our case, today this is the Institute Perunio di Energia Nuclear, shortened to IPEN. They are responsible for licensing and keeping track of all the country's users of radiation sources, of which there are around 1,200 individuals and around 15 registered radiography companies. This includes many fields, for example, X-raying, radiotherapy and non-destructive weld imaging. This is what will be the focus of our video here. Roll on our unnamed company, a Peru-based small radiography company. They had operated since the early 1980s and had been registered with IPEN. The company's history was not the most smooth, which you would not prefer with a company that deals with deadly materials. Basically, as noted in the IAEA report, into their later balls up, the company had left the radioactive source housing unattended at an oil field in 1982, which had subsequently been stolen. Don't worry, it would be fully recovered fairly quickly after some assistance from IPEM. This may have hindered the company continuing to operate, but Peru's legislation around radioactive sources at the time was primitive in 1982, and thus no punishment could be dealt to the company. The company would renew its license with IPEN on a regular basis, as required in the then improved Peruvian regulations of the 1990s. So you'd think the company was following the rules, right? And all was good. Well, yes and no, but we'll talk about this later on in the video. Anyways, this small company earned its money from industrial radiography, which was non-destructive testing using ionizing radiation. The company used an Iridium-192 sourced radiography camera. This was a projection type. The camera was where the source was contained when not being used for an exposure. This had 35 kilograms of depleted uranium as shielding from their Iridium-192 source. Inside the container was an S-shaped channel in which the source was housed when not in use. One end of the source had a thing called a pigtail, which would be attached to a drive cable for winding out for making an exposure. Each end of the container had a plug, at which one end was where the source guide tube was attached and the other was where the drive cable was attached to the pigtail. Once all attached, an operator could wind via a crank out the source along the guide tube out to its end. Now to make an exposure, a film plate is placed behind the item to be non-destructively tested. The source guide tube end is placed on the other side of the to be tested item. Then the operator would wind out the source to the end of the guide tube from a safe distance. Once wound out, the source is then kept there for the required exposure time, after which the source is wound back into its safe container. Now the company used ropes and signs to warn off any passers-by of any exposure being undertaken, and operators were given dosimeters and dose badges, although apparently these items were not really used in practice. 
Operators were responsible for the safe operation of the radiography source, and they were issued with an emergency kit, which included a radiation detector, handling tongs, additional shielding, warning signs, and extra ropes. Which leads us on to our disaster, which would occur at a hydroelectric plant site on the 20th of February 1999. The disaster. This is the Yanango Hydroelectric Plant near San Ramon, Peru. In February 1999, some repair works were being undertaken. A welder and his assistant were instructed to and started to repair a weld a two meter diameter pipe. The pipe would be under extreme pressure. As such, to make sure the repairs would be of good quality, the welds were arranged to be radiographed. The radiographic operator and his assistant set up their source guide tube at the area to be exposed. The plan originally was for the exposure to happen during lunchtime when the workers would be taking their break. However, the welding took longer than anticipated, thus the exposure would be delayed. The source container was left locked with the drive cable connected, but the guide tube was left disconnected. The welder returned at 2pm and continued working on the pipe. Meanwhile, the radiographer went on to do some ultrasonics testing of the pipe in a different area. Now, during this time at roughly 4pm, the welder found an interesting thing, a weird piece of metal on the ground. He picked it up, examined it in his hands and placed it in the back right pocket of his jeans. He chatted around 6pm with the radiographer, but didn't mention his discovery. Which is a shame, as it turned out that the item that he had found was the unshielded Iridium-192 source from the radiography device. He spent the next few hours working on the pipe, spending around half his time sitting. At 9pm, he felt a pain on his back right thigh. He finished the work around 10pm and took a minibus home. He got home around 10.30pm and took off his trousers, leaving them on the floor. He then changed his clothes and showed to his wife his painful area on his thigh. By now, a red mark had appeared. He went to a local doctor, who upon inspecting the irritation, put it down to an insect bite. During this time, at his home, his wife had sat on the jeans and breastfed her 18-month-old baby. Remembering that he had picked up something on the work site, the welder took the metallic item and put it into his bathroom. Meanwhile, back at the hydroelectric plant, the radiographer, around 10pm, had been informed of the completed welded pipework and set about getting the radiography machine ready for an exposure. During the process, the radiographer's assistant noticed that his survey meter was not showing any signs of radiation. Regardless, the radiographer went on to develop the exposed films of the repaired section of pipe, which yielded no signs of radiation exposure. What did he do with this information then? Well, at 10.30pm, he travelled into San Ramon to have dinner. Eventually, returning to the site at midnight, the concern of the exposure not being successful had finally hit the radiographer, who, on the torchlight, went inside the pipe and inspected the camera. He found the screws of the lock of the unit were loose. Worried, he disassembled the drive cable and found the vital source pigtail was not there. What did this mean? Well, there was no source in the radiography unit. It had vanished. The Iridium-192 and its 1.37 terabecules of radioactivity had gone. At 12.30 in the morning, he rushed back to San Ramon to tell the company, based in Lima, that the source was missing. In doing so, requesting more survey meters and personnel to assist with the search. The operator went about all of the residences of the workers on site during the day, finally reaching the front door of the welder at around 1am in the morning. They knocked on the door, and when greeted by the welder, he was asked if he had seen the source. He went to the bathroom and returned to the front of the house with it in his hands. The assistant survey meter began to indicate high radiation levels as they heard the footsteps approaching the door. The welder appeared holding the source with his bare hands. The radiographer, upon seeing the source, shouted for the welder to throw it into the street. The radiographer put a stone over the source and closed off the area. Leaving another member of staff by the source, he then got his emergency equipment. The source pigtail was reattached to the source drive cable, all whilst doing this by covering it up with some metal shielding. 
and after two minutes of wrangling, the source was safely returned to the camera container. The welder and his family would be sent to hospital for treatment, and it would not end out well. Aftermath On the 21st of February 1999, the welder was admitted to the National Cancer Hospital in Lima, roughly 20 hours post-exposure. He was entered with what looked like a rather large blister. Biopsies on his bone marrow showed severe damage. The estimated localised dose of radiation was 9,966 grey. This was estimated on a small portion of the welder's skin, with the dose estimated at 2,508 grey at a centimetre deep of the tissue. For context, a whole body dose of 10 grey or more can kill within hours. This meant that the welder had received 100 times the lethal dose, although being localised to just a small area, which would save his life, but sadly not his leg. He would eventually lose his leg after months of agony and a transfer to France for treatment. His wounds suffered severe necrosis, leaving the patient in constant pain and isolated from his family back home proved to hinder his progress. He was returned back to Peru on the 17th of October 1999. His prospects did improve as once again he was reunited with his family, albeit at an intensive care unit in a hospital near his home. But how did the source get out of its container in the first place? To be allowed to be picked up by someone who wouldn't have really known the full risk of the Iridium-192. It would turn out that although registering the import of a new Iridium-192 source in November 1998, the company failed to notify IPEN of the new source container, also known as the camera, in 1999. Thus the regulator was in the dark about the piece of equipment involved in the incident. This container would prove to be very easy to open even without a key, reportedly in the IAEA report with just simple screwdrivers. This meant that the container was vulnerable to unauthorised opening, and once unlocked, it was possible to just push out the source out of the camera with just a piece of wire. So theft couldn't really be ruled out then, as someone may have thought that the source could be valuable and something worth pocketing. But a second non-theft theory was also considered, in that the source could have accidentally fallen out of the camera after the plug had been removed, although the radiographer claimed that they had attached a drive cable to the pigtail. Error or theft, no one could really definitively prove either way. Not the company, IPEN or the IAEA. But the company had some other issues as well. It didn't have a radiation protection officer. Instead, the radiographer was filling in. However, they had not received all the correct training for the role that they were stepping up to doing, and it also turned out they hadn't even had the proper training for the radiographer's role. As noted in the IAEA report, the person responsible for carrying out the radiography was not fully trained and a qualified radiographer. It would have been the radiographer's responsibility to tell anyone working nearby of the risks of the machinery they were using, which did not happen. This included informing the welder, which again failed to happen. The whole event was a mess up, and it's something that we keep on seeing with radiation events. Poor training, no one knowing the risks, and poor regulations. It reminds me of other South American events I've covered before in radiation-based videos, such as the radiation bus or the Goiani incident. So that's my video on the Yanango radiological accident. It's going to be a 2 on my disaster scale, and this is what I've got for my root cause analysis card. Do you agree? Let me know in the comments below. This is a Plain Difficult production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Like Licensed. Plain Difficult, video Plain Difficult videos are produced by me, John, in a currently very warm corner of Southern London, UK. And all that's left to say is thank you very much for watching, and Mr Music, play us out, please.